There's been some questions about an interesting phrase in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, which encourages us to lay aside every weight and sin. And this verse has caused some degree of confusion and misapplication. And it makes some people think that they must strive to stop sinning through their own self-effort. And this, like every other form of religion, will lead to spiritual and emotional bondage and ultimately death instead of the freedom and life that Christ sacrificed to give us. So what I would like to share with you today is a different perspective on what it means to lay aside every weight and sin. And it doesn't rely on your efforts. It doesn't rely on your own sacrifices or your own strength, but it relies entirely on the finished work of Christ, the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And as you see this truth today, you will rejoice along with me at how easy Christ has made all of this for us. So join me today as we look at what it means to lay aside every weight, not from the perspective of religion, not from the perspective of man's theology, but from the perspective of the finished work of Christ. Welcome to Thriving Branch. I'm Jim, and today we are going to be looking at a verse of scripture which has caused some confusion, which has caused some people to question, which has caused some people to consider their own efforts. And that's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And one of the phrases found in the verse is a directive to lay aside every weight and sin. And that's obviously caused some questioning and caused some confusion. And let me encourage you right from the start, if ever you have one of these questions, if ever you're reading a verse of scripture and it just doesn't seem to make sense or it sounds very religious or legalistic, I would encourage you to never be afraid to continue studying. Don't be afraid to honestly look at that verse and maybe look at it in context, read the verses around it. Because as you get the broader picture of what the context of the verse is, who it's speaking to, um, the, the overall idea, Jesus will usually be more clearly seen. Remember, the entirety of Scripture is ultimately about Jesus showing you aspects of him, showing you pictures of what he has done. And so as we begin today, we're going to be doing this by looking at the verses of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And right away, just getting that little bit more context from verse 2, we'll begin to see the light of Christ from what is typically seen in a religious way, in a legalistic fashion. So, this is going to be exciting. Let's read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Read this with me. Ready? 1, 2, read. Therefore, seeing we also are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, as I mentioned in the opening, the typical way that verse 1 is understood and taught by the average religious leader is that you need to put an end to all your sinful actions 
because there are all these witnesses, meaning the people, watching you and it will ruin your reputation to have sin in your life. Now, to be honest, I do understand where these people are coming from. I understand the logic that is behind what they're implying. I understand their heart. However, as with most religious man-centered ideas, that idea presented by those religious leaders that you need to stop your sin and it will ruin your reputation to have sin in your life and all this, that idea proceeds from a wrong foundation. And that wrong foundation is the foundation of our own ability, our own strength. And here's a hint for you. We don't have any. We don't have any ability. We don't have any strength in ourselves to stop our sin. We don't have it. it that's, that strength isn't there. We're drawing from a dry well when we start to look from our own strength. If we actually had any ability to stop our sinful actions, then Christ wouldn't have needed to die to save us, since we would be then capable of saving ourselves. Think about it. If we actually had the ability to stop sin, if we actually had the ability to stop our sinful actions, then we would be able to live perfectly and there would be no need for a sin sacrifice. That's not my idea, by the way. That's actually Paul's argument from Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, and Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We don't have that ability. So the verses here in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, specifically verse 1, isn't telling us that we need to exercise our own power to stop sinful actions. Because that charge would be ultimately fruitless. It wouldn't, it wouldn't actually accomplish anything. So what are these verses saying? What is Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 actually talking about? Well, this is another example where looking at the context, as I mentioned, and looking at the original language can offer us some additional details and help us understand what the verses are actually saying to us. First of all, look at verse 1. We see the phrase, lay aside every weight. And specifically that one term, lay aside, in the Greek language is actually the word apatithomai, which means to put away. It means to put away. The same phrasing is used when husbands would put away their wives for adultery or other reasons. This putting away is a very strong, very harsh word, which signifies a complete cutting off. Complete cutting off, equal to death. That's why it was used when husbands would put away their wives. And that point is a very important detail to keep in mind as we continue. So just keep that fact in the back of your mind or write it down in a note. Just remember that. Next, we see that we are to lay aside, put away, as in a death, every weight, which is whatever burdens you. The Greek word for weight is agkos, which means a heavy mass of burdens. And the verse continues, and the sin that so easily besets us. And this right here is where the religious people run wild. This is where the legalists love to turn this thing into a work of your strength and efforts and say, see, you need to get rid of your sin. But the problem with that is that the word sin here is the noun and not the verb. And that fact gives us another bit of insight into what the verse is really telling us. 
Much like the heavy burden and the bondage of the Old Covenant law mentioned in Acts chapter 15, verse 10, this burdensome weight that we are supposed to put away is the burden of the Old Covenant mindset and the old identity, your old spiritual identity of sin. That's why it's a noun here and not a verb. You see, we lay aside, we put away that old identity through death. That's why that first fact I mentioned was so important. We put it away through death, specifically as our old identity died on the cross with Christ. And we reckon, that means account, our old identity to indeed be dead and gone. As mentioned in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, we are to reckon ourselves dead to sin, the noun, the old identity of a sinner. Reckon ourselves dead to that old identity and realize that it is not who you are today in Christ Jesus. Are you listening? You are alive as a completely new creation. And the mark and the stain of sin is no longer on you anymore because you have been entirely regenerated by Christ. You have been washed in his sacrificial blood. You have been cleansed by him. It is entirely inaccurate to call such a new creation a sinner. Are you hearing me? It is not who you are today. You are a completely new creation in Christ, made so by him. And it is entirely false to still call yourself a sinner because that is not who you are. You're not in that place. That is not your identity. So this verse here, if we, as we read this, we are to put away as a death that old covenant mentality, that old identity of sin. Okay, we got that part. Now, how are we supposed to do it? How are we supposed to put that old identity away? Are there still works and self-effort involved? Well, now, let's take a look at verse 2. This is where the context, the slightly broader context of verse 2 makes a huge difference. This is the part that most religious leaders fail to include after reading verse 1. And verse 2 here certainly doesn't waste any time in getting right to the point. This is why most religious leaders don't read verse 2. They just quote off verse 1 and keep you in the bondage of your works. But look at what verse 2 is saying. Verse 2 gets right to the point. Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. This, my friend, is the point. This is the point. This is how you accomplish it. You don't try to put away your own sin. Instead, you look to Jesus. You look to Jesus and realize that he already put away your entire sinful identity through his death on the cross. In the same way, that everyone bitten by the poisonous serpents lived when they looked upon the bronze serpent on the pole. We have an entire separate study just on that incident. I would encourage you to also view that study. In the same way as they looked upon that bronze serpent and they lived, so also do we live 
when we look upon the substitutionary atonement of Christ Jesus on the cross. He didn't have his own sins laid upon him on the cross. He didn't have any sin. So the sin that was laid upon him and he took all that punishment for was our sin. It wasn't his, it was ours. So we look upon that, we realize my sin and your sin was laid upon Jesus on that cross. And he was beaten for it. He was punished for it. It was judged in his body. And my friend, when he said it was finished, I believe he meant what he said. When he said, to tell us die, it's paid in full, I believe he meant what he said. So often, through religious indoctrination and man-made theology, we become so focused on what we perceive to be our own sin, and we spend all of our time looking at our sin rather than the solution that Christ already offered. Are you hearing me, people? By doing this, by looking at our own sin, we miss the point of it all. We get trapped in a works mindset that brings us nothing but condemnation and death. I know because I lived in that realm for many years, and it drove me further and further downward every single day. I began to hate God. I began to hate my Bible. I began to hate myself. I lived in the place of condemnation and guilt and shame for years. And I didn't know a way out until Jesus Christ introduced himself to me. I had plenty of religious knowledge but I had no perception of who Jesus really was. The way out of that is not by trying harder. It's not by gripping tighter. It's not by striving more. The way out is to realize all of the weight, all of that heavy burden of that old dead identity is to look squarely at Jesus, see his sacrifice for you, and all of that burden gets released. Look at Jesus and realize that what he was beaten for what he was punished for was actually your sin, personally. Not just some ethereal idea of, yeah, he was punished on the cross, but, but I'm not really sure why I still have all this sin. No, 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 my friend. Your sin is there on that cross. And look at what he suffered. Look at your sin being righteously judged on that cross in the body of Jesus Christ. That, that body on that cross is our body, our old identity. The sacrifice of Christ is not a formal, abstract thing. It's a personal payment. Do you see? Do you understand? It's a personal payment for you. He did not die as himself because he had no sin. He had no sin of his own to die for. I know some of you might be scratching your head and not understanding how this is made personal. So 
Let's take a little detour to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I want you to see this because this is so important. This is foundational to your understanding of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Read this with me. One, two, read. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Do you see, my friend? Jesus was made sin for you. Not just in a general way. He was made sin for you. Those were your sins that he paid for on the cross. And that was your old identity as a sinner hanging on the cross. And as the second half of the verse makes clear, the result of that payment is equally as personal as the first part. Your rebirth as a new creation. Jesus was made to be your sin so that you would be made the righteousness of God in him. Do you see? Jesus was made sin with your sins without doing any sin of his own. In the same manner, you were made righteous with his righteousness without doing any righteousness of your own. Clear? This is how you are to truly lay aside every weight, my friend. You drop that old identity and that old covenant religious mindset and you fully embrace who you truly are today in Christ. That's exactly how you do it. And it's easy. A divinely righteous child of God is who you are today, not a sinner. The reason you are a divinely righteous child of God today is because that is exactly who he has made you to be through his sacrifice. I encourage you today, my friend, receive this truth for all that it's worth. And I say to you, with all sincerity, in Christ, be blessed. Thank you for joining me for today's Bible study. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others. And be sure to check out thrivingbranch.com where you will find a lot more information and resources on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You also find how you're able to support this ministry through your prayers, your shares, and your financial giving as the Spirit of God leads you. We also have some t-shirts and other accessories. They make great gifts and they help you to express your faith and look good doing it too. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already done so and click the notification bell to always be notified whenever new videos are posted. As always, my friend, be blessed.